Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm Paula, and I'm with Radical Exchange. And today, I'm delighted to have with us Pooja Ohavar, who is here to share a bit of her latest thinking through a very dynamic multimedia presentation that she has prepared, um, which is called Communication, Consensus, and Power, Decentralization in the Age of AI. So this presentation is going to bring together many of the concepts that we work to advance at Radical Exchange and in the plurality ecosystem um, in the context of generative models. Um, we also have we here with us Glenn Weil, who has contributed to uh, many of these concepts. So after the presentation, we'll have a group discussion where you can ask both Pooja and Glenn any questions that you might have. And for the benefit of those who are not here with us today, we'll also record this presentation and it will be published on the Radical Exchange YouTube channel. Um, so it's already recording now. Um, a little bit about Pooja is she's a lawyer and a technologist. She's a part of the Getting Plurality Research Group at Harvard's uh, Safra Center for Ethics. She has um, co-authored a paper with Glenn Weil and Vitalik Buterin called Decentralized Societies, Finding Web3 So, which has introduced many new ideas and concepts and frameworks to the Web3 space, and also has inspired uh, many new protocols and initiatives and startups. So it's very, it was very generative uh, content as is um, the content of the presentation that you're about to see now. So uh, thank you so much for being with us, Pooja. I'm really excited uh, for your presentation. But before getting us started, I'll hand it over to Glenn, who has seen this before, and will give us a little bit of framing. Uh, thanks, Paula. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with both Paula and Pooja a lot over the last uh, uh, five or six years. And um, Pooja has been a really close intellectual partner in everything that I've been doing really in the last uh, three years or so. Um, and she's put together this kind of dizzying presentation. It's got a huge amount of content and it's really drinking from fire hose. Um, but I hope it will give people at least an impression of how some of the different things we've been working on can fit together and uh, do so in a very multimedia way that um, provokes us all to think broader. So really looking forward to your reactions and feedback on Pooja's work and the broader work that it sort of uh, represents. So Pooja, take it away. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Paula. Let me just share my screen. Uh, are we good, Paula? Yes, all good. Okay. Great. So uh, yeah, as, as Glenn warned you, you're kind of, you'll be drinking from the fire hose. So just want to give a warning that I, I start with babies and build to networks. And it's about a, a 30 minute journey. Um, and I use a lot of language and a lot of symbols. So I encourage folks to just pay attention to the visual as much as the verbal, as I'll be kind of using all of your senses to pump your intuitions. So let me get started. It is remarkable that I'm sitting here, that I can utter these string of sounds and they're intelligible to you and that you understand what I mean. Moreover, if I said, I love you all, you would assume one of two things. I'm delusional or I'm lying. You not only understand what these sounds mean, you can also infer some things about me when I say it. But strings of sound don't just mysteriously convey meaning. Depending on the audience's background beliefs, words have power. Strings of sound can stir men towards progress, start wars, turn the tide of wars, usher in peace, or motivate a generation. Language is human's greatest invention. And like food, language can either nourish us or poison us. And so the question today is, how do we govern and align exponentially powerful technologies built off our conversations when in conversations themselves, we are often debating, politicking, and fumbling our way towards truth. When we talk alignment, one string of words that resonates with the audience here is the word decentralization. But what does that word mean? Many refer to other words to explain it. But perhaps the best way to understand this word is to look at the most decentralized invention we have to date, 
language. And instead of modeling an idealized version of how language ought to work, let's start with our intuitive and uncorrected view of language. And let's start with basics and a word that has nourished us all, love. We're born into this world given a name. This is our first contact with language and with love. We grow into a broader set of affection, solidarities, branching beyond our families to our schools and neighborhoods. Each of these communities are strange at first and then become familiar, and we have changing magnitudes of affection and trust towards them. Moreover, each of these communities have different conversational norms and boundaries. What you say, how you say it is different in each of these contexts. I love you, dad. I love you, school crush. I love you, sweet heavenly baby Jesus. Love means different things in each of these contexts. And yet there are words that have unambiguous meanings, table, chair, school, parent. Learning language is learning correlations of words and social contexts. These correlations of words and contexts also become correlations of beliefs and desires. A mysterious interaction between our hearts and our minds correlates what we hear with what we believe and what we want. Highly religious parents impart their beliefs to their kids. In mimesis, kids want a toy just because other kids want it, not knowing what it does. Through these conversations, starting at the dinner table, moving to the classroom and beyond, we form and evolve our beliefs, desires, preferences, and the words to express them. As a kid, my siblings generally share the same memberships, the same social geometry with little social distance. We are correlated in our beliefs and desires, and we're correlated in how we use words to express them. But as we enter adolescence, we broaden our communities and self-differentiate. We form secret societies. We fall in love. We fall out of love and retreat to our families. And at some point, many choose to enter a gated conversation where we agree to learn and get tested and measured how well we converse by discipline's rules. Some like math have right and wrong answers. And some like law have a rich set of procedural practices that are continually under conversational scrutiny but nonetheless lay the ground rules for debating the bounds of what is legal versus illegal, contested versus uncontested, admissible versus inadmissible, and so on. And at some point we join a larger political conversation where we have rights of participation and a say in how a larger nested coordination is governed. So as we age, we grow a rich network of overlapping solidarities and memberships to different communities with different magnitudes of affection. These communities are perpetually in fluid stochastic recombination, contracting and expanding. But is this what we mean by decentralized language, recombining stochastic conversations? Well, no. Sometimes conversations get snuffed out, groups get annihilated, languages disappear. Language does not have a peaceful decentralized equilibrium. Instead, communities have metastable governance structures, which influence how the conversation unfolds what is said, in what order, who says, when, and how. One governance structure touted by the more egalitarian-minded is one person, one vote, where everyone gets an equal say. Ancient Athens experimented with this, and it left the most skilled conversational of the time, Socrates, murdered by a tyranny of the majority. This coincided with the loss of the Peloponnesian War, the end of the old golden age of Athens. Maybe not a coincidence. But there's a second touted model, raw capitalism or one dollar, one vote or one token, one vote, like Bitcoin. The more dollars you have, the more hash power you can buy, the more Bitcoin you can mine. But let's look at this from the perspective of the community constituting Bitcoin in dark mode. Aspirationally, the Bitcoin community is a sea of anon subscribing to the rules of Bitcoin capitalism. But in one token, one vote capitalism, money buys power, here literally hash power, and not everyone has the same resources to start with, and even if they do, no one shares the same savings or consumptions rate. So what do we end up with? Plutocracy, a panel of miners and pool operators that constitute 90% of Bitcoin's hash power, all on a panel together at a conference. But like direct democracy, plutocracy has a social effect here too on our conversations. If one token, one vote is about buying influence, then the rich have more power and the social circles start to coalesce around them. Culturally, the less wealthy who aspire to have that power too engage in speculation, hyper-financialization, and looting networks through 51% attacks. When one token, one vote models are applied to businesses with increasing returns, 
the power of plutocrats can increase exponentially. Apple farms subject to decreasing returns is not the same as data farms subject to increasing returns. And the power of increasing returns can lead plutocrats to have outsized or correlated influence over political parties, national security, social media, and technology, including AI. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So how do these two models stack up against each other? With one person, one vote, votes are too cheap for those who care little and too expensive for those who care a lot. With one dollar, one vote, the opposite is true. Votes are too expensive for those who care little and too cheap for those who care a lot. But there's also a third model, authoritarianism. One person deciding what's communicated, how, and to whom. The more information an authoritarian has, the greater control they exert, which allows them to control information even more in a self-reinforcing cycle towards greater and greater power. Inconvenient dissidents that challenge this power tend to disappear. And eventually people end up talking about what the dictator wants them to talk about. And the social distance between conversational clusters narrow. Citizens become symbols for the dictator, equivalent to mindless bots, and we get language inversion, where meaning does not map onto reality and where we collapse into contradiction. It's no coincidence that the greatest abuses of power are marked by the greatest abuses of language. So when it comes to governance over communication, we have these three models, one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, and authoritarianism. And each of these end up empowering some set of groups over others, tyrannical majorities, looting plutocrats, controlling dictators, with social consequences, at worst turning us into murderous majorities, hyper-financialized apes, or civil robots. All of them universally narrowing and homogenizing the social groups to which we belong, as well as the breadth and depth of conversation. But we generally don't see these extremes, we see correctives or checks and balances, pushing us towards something in the center, drawing on the virtue of either of these approaches while compensating for weaknesses. For example, direct democracy has given way to the idea of constitutional republics marked by separation of powers, constitutionalism, common law, federalism, and so on. Forcing conversations among competing groups representing different interests, domestic circles, foreign circles, and even long dead founding fathers requiring some translation. Similarly, modern corporate, corporate governance is a rejection of pure token voting. And instead we have a compromise with the CEO, board and shareholders with forced information disclosure by way of law to enrich these conversations. Even authoritarian regimes like to keep the optics of democracy with elections, even if rigged and capitalism, even if crony. So in the 20th century, this simplistic model has given way to this, autocracy, constitutional republics, and corporations. And with exponentially powerful information technologies, the 21st century is seeing another variation on the same theme, digital democracy, synthetic technocracy, and corporate libertarianism. And today we see instances of all these governance structures in the diverse conversational communities we belong to. Going back to kids, even they experience a variety of governance structures, which influences what, how, and when they talk. If born Catholic, they learn the Vatican's rules on what's conversationally unacceptable or heresy. If they go to a public, parochial, or private school, they get exposed to mixed governance, being accountable towards the state, church, and dollars, respectively, in different degrees. And perhaps we see the greatest variance at a family's dinner table, of course, except when kids outnumber parents, and then we have pure anarchy. Now, these governance structures influence how conversations cluster and recombine, and more deeply how words come to correlate with meaning, belief, and desires. Authoritarian regimes are an extreme example, with greater clustering, less recombination, and collapse of meaning into contradiction. How do generative foundation models change conversational dynamics? Will they collapse us into singularity like authoritarianism? majoritarianism with one person, one vote, or plutocratic pump and dumps with one token, one vote? Or will we have rich intersectionality? Well, let's consider our latest touch point with digital communication, social media. In exchange for using these communitarian paradises for free, we let them hoover up our conversations in a giant information commons, where we graze on addictive algorithms, often feeding on anger, paranoia, and vanity. So far, so good. 
But let's break down actually what's really happening here. We enter these channels ready to communicate, but our words travel instantaneously beyond the intended audience and context in which they were made, causing socially distant audiences to misjudge and become outraged and engage. Even if our words aren't intended to become maximally controversial scissor statements, they become so, and this has several consequences. First, communication traveling beyond context has cleaved groups, and artificially so. Algorithms aside, outraged groups pull in socially proximate conversational clusters and empathetic outrage. Second, because people are broadcasting to a giant conversational commons, primed to graze on it in the most controversial way, speech is chilled. And instead, we encourage a different kind of speech, anonymous trolling. And this unaccountable mob behavior leaves our digital spaces and invades our physical spaces, even in law schools like my alma mater, where the conversational norm is to make your case through coherent arguments, not masks and not memes. Now, what about the unseen? By throwing people into a conversational commons and then outraging and cleaving them, we erase local conversational groups, local speech norms, local context. But these boundaries are important. Words do not have an inherent meaning, but are relational and contextual, embedded in a constellation of facts, circumstances, relationships, and most importantly, shared beliefs of the audience. When I say, I love you, Clearly, that is not the same love when I tell my son, I love you. And by erasing boundaries, instead of contextual communication, we get context collision, reducing our plurality into polarity, where people are confused and our ability to communicate is fundamentally impaired. Rather than wrestle with hard and controversial ideas openly, we talk less, debate less, refine less. Instead, we find ourselves unwittingly in cleaved conversational clusters in correlated meme and cancel culture verses. These social media correlations become financial correlations. Finance becomes vulnerable to speculation and hyperfinancialization. Digital bank runs tweak themselves into existence. Words become lowest common denominator. Words become lowest common denominator means correlating beliefs and desires into actions to the point where Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Washington, and crypto conversational clusters start stress testing public confidence games like credit markets to their correlation limits. And the limits are not as difficult to break as you might think, just a threshold, 10 to 20% of the population believing otherwise, and suddenly bullets are worth more than Bitcoin. And we get the worst of all antisocial behaviors, mindless bots, anonymized mobs, hyper-financialization. Hyper what governance model has led to this? Well, it's not completely one dollar, one vote capitalism because users get to use a platform for free and data creators have no residual rights. But it's also not one person, one vote democracy because there are clearly a class of shareholders profiting off cleavages and collision courses. It's actually a tragedy of the conversational commons, combining the worst aspects of captured communism, one conversational commons like nationalized oil fields, and the worst aspects of capitalism, where a few control a rent extracting, brain fracking monopoly. It's something oscillating between synthetic technocracy, where an elite optimizes with a God's eye view, and corporate libertarianism that sends rents to a class of shareholders increasingly correlated with technocrats. Now, could generative foundation models make our conversations worse? How? Well, GFMs are trained off various data sets, including we can assume conversations in the information commons scraped from the internet. They generate text by identifying correlations and finding complex nonlinear relationships between words and phrases within the training data. The problem is not simply that the data sets from our commons have traveled outside their context, the facts, background beliefs, and relationships that the words embed within, thereby eroding our communicative capacity. The problem is GFMs can recombine data sets into plausible deep fakes that flood the information commons, which then feed back into the training models in a vicious cycle, accelerating context collision into full context collapse.
When our background beliefs about consensus reality fracture, we lose our ability to form strings of sounds that are intelligible, conveying meaning. For communication to happen, a shared background belief is required, that I am here, that the sun is shining, that I am talking, and an assumption that most of what I am saying I actually believe to be true. Disagreement and agreement alike are intelligible only against a background of massive agreement. Meaning and belief are inextricably linked. But is there another future where GFMs augment communicative capacity and make us more intelligible to each other while grounding us in truth and a shared consensus reality, where instead of collapsing into singularity, we expand into plurality? I think so. How do we get there? Well, many model social graphs on individuals, but individuals are networks of groups, just as groups are networks of individuals. They are mutually defined duality like waves and particles. So model emergent groups, not just sovereign individuals. Step two, we reintroduce the boundaries we have in physical space into digital space, make the physically implicit digitally explicit. Not all communication should be broadcast into space. And as an extension of two, represent memberships to groups with socially programmable objects represented here as triangles that confer rights of participation and importantly make explicit the channel's governance mechanism. Is governance one person, one vote, one dollar, one vote, quadratic vote? Is it an attention auction? What's the algo? Express the mechanism in a governance triangle. The constellation of these triangles represent our access and governance over digital communication channels we participate in. You can call them soul bound because they represent your access and no one else's. Or you can call them community bound as communities grant these memberships or access rights. And again, like wave particle duality, individuals and communities are two different angles to the same phenomena. Let's take the community view. When a community has one person, one vote, each member holds this programmable triangle representing their access right or credential to community conversation and their right to vote on how this channel is governed and how their shared conversational data is used. For example, what information the community chooses to reveal, to whom, and in exchange for what, money or information from another group. In other words, the triangle confers the right to vote on the group's privacy. Some channels might not have governance rights. If everyone is part of the Putin channel, it becomes clear to them that holding a black triangle, Putin can, controls the channel. Here, the triangle is simply making the implicit explicit. Now, once we represent governance, the next step is to improve it to better price influence. Rather than the perils of one person, one vote, and one token, one vote, where influence is either too cheap or too expensive, we can make marginal cost of influence proportional to how much you value a good through quadratic voting, quadratic funding, or some variation of square root voting. Quadratic voting and funding are partial correctives to the majoritarian tyrannies of one person, one vote, and plutocracy of one dollar, one vote, pushing us nonetheless towards the center. But it's not enough because it's just correcting for one kind of correlation when there are many other hidden correlations because of our conversational and social ties. To draw an analogy to stars, on the surface, we look like these self-sovereign stars emanating idiosyncratic beliefs and desires through space and time. And so we square root over the intensity of our preferences so we can differentiate and also see the light from other stars as light obeys an inverse square law. But light is also a wave and has properties instantaneously entangled with other light waves across vast distances. We wanna know underneath the intensity of our preferences, underneath the intensity of our light, how correlated our spin or biases with other people's light waves by this invisible, messy, stochastic social process we call communication, especially when digital communication accelerates these entanglements across distance. So rather than treat people as the same uncorrelated, non-conversational, sovereign individual without social ties, we take an extra step. We cluster people by their overlap and similarity and then discount influence based on shared conversational memberships or shared triangles, as well as revealed behavior. In other words, 
We don't treat a hundred duped puppets or mindless bots having the same narrow clustered conversations, the same as a highly intersectional person debating across very different groups. We acknowledge the spin or bias of correlated conversational groups and discount against it so they don't secretly collude to swamp voting. For example, if this is a simplified representation of my conversational clusters, and this is a representation of my siblings, you would find these conversational overlaps. No two people are having the same conversation, but everyone has varying degrees of overlap and social distance to everyone else. We acknowledge this overlap and discount for the correlation. Financial markets offer a helpful analogy. Just as portfolio managers ring out the idiosyncratic risk of poor managerial judgment and dysfunctional corporate culture by diversifying across less correlated assets, similarly, communities can ring out idiosyncratic risk by discounting across correlated conversational clusters prone to share bias and make the same errors in judgment. Now, this doesn't eliminate systematic risk, but it does ring out the idiosyncratic risk, which left unchecked unnecessarily adds risk into the system and obfuscates the real systematic risks for us to focus on. So back to our governance triangle. If quadratic voting and funding are partial correctives, adding correlation discounting turns governance into a prism, allowing communities to bend and refract what is otherwise monolithic light into differentiated colors. So we can see the unique colors of less biased, less correlated perspectives sharply and in their full brilliance. This prism governance is consensus across difference, where we weigh the intensity of preferences of the more, more conversationally distant, less correlated, and less overlapping to surface proposals more likely to be in the community's interest rather than any cluster's private interest, which might give them more information or control advantage over everyone else. So, Consensus across difference also implies community collusion resistance. Collusion resistance is particularly important when a community is, is negotiating to share data with another community, which may have overlapping members and a conflict of interest, or when it decides to say auction off or federate some of their data to a third party, which may have overlapping shareholders. Now, when communities rely on consensus across difference as a governance mechanism, and scale up in their cooperative agreements with other communities, they form collusion resistant networks where more conversationally distant communities have a greater influence than the clustered and conversationally near. Checking the concentration of information and control or what we call power of a cluster of groups and instead rebalancing it perpetually as these groups stochastically recombine. So instead of private goods, networks are able to generate shared network goods resistant to political capture and economic extraction. Now, what does this mean for the individual? Just as collusion resistance leans on the diversity among the very conversationally distant to surface what's in the community's interest, community recovery leans on the diversity to secure your private interest or account where a qualified majority of your uncorrelated conversational partners can recover your account. In other words, collusion resistance for networks implies community recovery for the individual. So now we start to get a more robust sense of what we mean by decentralization, not by reference to these other concepts begging for definitions or by treating all people the same with one person, one vote or treating all money equally with one token, one vote. Rather, decentralization requires surfacing hidden correlations when events are not as statistically independent as presumed to be leading to accidental failures, or when people are not as conversationally distant as presumed to be, leading to intentional attacks. Fault tolerance and attack resistance are not inherent properties, but relational properties, and failures are the result of hidden correlations leading to hidden governance games or hidden triangles. The prism of collusion resistance governance protects against these failures, starting with communities, and scaling into networks. So we arrive at a conception of decentralization that is coherent across all social scales, individuals, communities, and networks. Collusion resistance, consensus across difference, and community recovery are mutually implicated properties of decentralized systems. 
Now that we have a conception of how decentralization works, how are these concepts relevant relevant for generative foundation models and augmenting our communicative capacity? Recall, GFMs are trained off various data sets. We can reasonably assume that these data sets include conversations in the information commons. They are increasing returns from economies of scale and economies of scope to these models. The more inputs and the greater diversity of inputs they receive, the more powerful they are at representing a mysterious syntax, the rules of grammar underlying human communication. It's not feasible for communities to train their own frontier GFMs that have as rich a syntax as these large language models. Moreover, the underlying architectures and structures actually have more similarities than differences. So what can we do? Ideally, conversational communities would fine tune and adapt GFMs to their local context, using the prism of consensus across difference to surface diverse agreement on important questions like what constitutes training data for the local adaptation, what privacy preserving techniques should be used, and how adjustments to the weights and biases of these adapted models should be made in both supervised learning and reinforcement learning. In this way, communities could have sovereignty in how the model behaves when it comes to things that are relevant to them. And someone from China, for example, wouldn't have as much an authority to say a model, how should the model behave when it comes to questions about Audrey Tang, for example, as someone in Taiwan. Building on subsidiarity, many communities running their local adaptations on these GFMs could feed back elements or properties to the larger GFMs in a federated way. Or better yet, these partially localized and adapted models could help communities negotiate with each other to share data about each other, to build larger nested adaptations. So we would have localized adaptations interoperating, overlapping, and recombining into larger adaptations with partially shared data sets. By using consensus across difference at the local level, and scaling up to collusion resistance at the network level, this larger networked AI could capture and refract out the background shared beliefs of local context composing into network context and feed back these properties into GFMs in a federated way to improve the weights and biases of the GFMs so, locally, so localized adaptations would continuously improve them while GFMs in return would fine tune from the, a local networked model. In sum, we get partial adaptations interoperating with other partial adaptations that together form a network model that improves, fine tunes, and ultimately aligns a generative foundation model in a federated way. The analogy is there is a fleet of giant ships that are more similar than different. As they stop in each port, they add on a sail, getting bigger and more powerful. These ships all have a magnitude and a direction. At the same time, there are a sea of smaller boats with much more differentiation, rowboats, fishing boats, speed boats, shrimp boats, etc., with their own magnitudes and directions. Now imagine all of these smaller boats latch a rope to the larger ships, gaining the speed and momentum of the larger ship but at the same time shifting the magnitude and direction of the ship. We don't know in advance how these forces will cancel each other out. Instead, the main question for us is, how many ropes does a boat get and how strong do we want these ropes to be? In other words, how much influence should these smaller boats have? Do they all get treated the same? Is it based on how much goal they have? Or do we look at where the boats came from, how similar they are, and how many of them have walkie-talkies coordinating their pull. We aim consensus across difference at the boat level and collusion resistance at the ship level. So like decentralization, we get a rich conception of AI alignment that is coherent and consistent across all social scales, individuals, communities, and networks, discounting the biases of the conversationally near and correlated, where the most distant communities check, constrain, and fine tune the weights and biases of a networked AI, and where ceaselessly recombining communities leads to richer and richer expressions of overlapping complex and even canceling out preferences. And in the process, we get rich information provenance, 
where we can tell if an artificial generation arose from a socially distant group without conversational overlap, or if the generation emerged from credible conversational clusters with shared secrets and designated verifier proofs, thereby empowering us to curate our attention to engage in conversations about credible information facilitating greater networked cooperation. Now, why can't we get our collusion resistant AI today? Well, that would require companies like OpenAI to share their model. Now, taking the principle of charity here, it doesn't want to do this because we don't have our boats lined up and malicious, well-coordinated pirate ships could come to over-influence the GFM. We want everyone to have access to nuclear energy, but not everyone should have nuclear weapons, which takes us back here to the task of reintroducing digital boundaries and representing governance with objects, triangles, that refract out consensus across difference and reintroduce context. But we're here, erasing boundaries, contemplating eyeball scans and one person, one vote schemes. That's why we need to start building new communication channels that enable communities to localize credible governance and build a collusion resistant governance infrastructure we need. And to get us started, a plural cooperative known as the PCC has introduced and gifted a plural communication channel as a starting point for experimentation, a discourse fork where the agenda is surfaced by collusion resistant quadratic voting. This discourse fork allows you to express the intensity of your preferences with hearts, but at the same time, it recognizes and discounts the social cluster you're a part of based on correlation factors set by the community, whether it be workplace, geography, or political affiliation. This way, minority voices don't get drowned out and communities can surface questions which multiple perspectives agree on is interesting. Now, this is just a placeful first step, but we nonetheless hope communities will run their own instance of this and experiment and build on it. And with tools like plural communication channels, the goal is to augment our communicative capacity and cooperation across groups, harnessing collective intelligence. So with credible information, agents can ceaselessly and fluidly recombine into new groups with a multiplicity of aims into a thickening web of interweaving solidarities that cuts open asymmetries in information and control, or what we call power. Many people communicating in a networked way, governing partially and plurally, continuously recomposing into fluid social groups, so one or a cluster doesn't come to dominate them all. And so ironically, to keep AI aligned, we just have to keep talking and talking about the things that matter to us, like love, but to the people we actually love with boundaries around these conversations. And then AI can help us keep talking, not just to our near and dear, but also to the conversationally distant, the foreign and the strange, generating conversational bridges to communities at any social scale, near and far, to keep language a source of nourishment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pooja. Um, this was fascinating. Um, I think perhaps now if you could, yeah, stop sharing your screen and then if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask uh, or comments to kickstart our group discussion, uh, please raise your hands. Matt, I see you clapping. Do you have anything to share to get us started? I don't have a question right now, but I think uh, Stefan has one in the chat there. Oh, I see. Um, can you expand on negotiation process between groups on how the negotiation process between groups would work? If consensus on communication norms is what makes a group, then is it possible for groups to engage? Um, I think so. Glenn, you feel free also to jump in here. Um, so I think part of the problem is we've started off sort of on the wrong foot with this kind of information commons, but we can, uh, as groups, just create boundaries around our conversations and then federate on that data, even, even, even for example, on LLM training. Um, so there are examples of federation, maybe Glenn, you can speak up here, 
Uh, but I don't think it's impossible. Oops, my computer just died. Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what I would say is if you think about the internet, this is exactly what it's about. So the internet was a network of networks. And the notion is that every network had internal communication protocols and the internet tried to create a thin layer that would allow for interoperability across these networks while preserving the underlying architecture and affordances of the networks that it connected. And so, and, and you can also think about this in like languages versus dialects versus, you know, in-group talk, et cetera. There are always going to be not fully hierarchical, but partly nested different levels of sort of uh, specificity that languages and communicative groups will take on. And so interoperation requires both like a higher, broader level norm that it permits that kind of communication, and at the same time, boundaries around the narrower group communications to ensure that things don't get shared out to that broader context that like undermine the norms of the more specific group. Um, Christopher, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, I really enjoyed it. Um, the sort of basic concept of, if I understand it correctly, the use of these generative foundation models to kind of uh, translate metaphor between increasingly wide or uh, diverse contextual circles makes sense to me. I guess the question that comes to mind immediately is just, you know, into these models, there's this training process, which has, let's call it like an alignment input, right? Like someone chooses what counts as good training examples. And it seems to me like in order to, you know, scale this, we want to synchronize the accounting system tracking, you know, interdependency relations between groups, like kind of the financial system, and the uh, tuning weights for these models. Uh, so that you know, if you have, I mean, for example, a trusted partner or a close circle of colleagues or like highly trusted friends, you probably also trust these people, you know, perhaps in slightly different dimensions to uh, fine tune your model, or you want to use their fine tuning somehow to influence yours, right? We want to. Uh, it seems to me at least that we want to synchronize these things as opposed to desynchronizing them. Um, and I'm just curious if, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Pooja, do you mind if I take this one? Go for it. Yeah, so um, I think that's an important aspect of it, the sort of what I would call subsidiarity or localization. But I actually think the opposite side, the sort of cooperation across differences at least is important. Um, putting aside anything about safety or adaptation just to the performance of the models, because what we know is that these things are extremely uh, sensitive to the diversity of the data. The diversity of the data determines their overall performance, but we don't really have a good definition of diversity of data, right? We like, I mean, people have some broad notion that like, you, oh, you train it on language and it works well in mathematics or whatever. But like, if we can actually think about what diversity of data means, and directly provide incentives for creating diverse data. Uh, that I think will be a very powerful engine for accelerating the ability to achieve value and scale with these things. So I actually think this like principle of tracking diversity, both for the goal of localizing to that diversity, but also for sort of being able to understand what is the greatest value add is going to be very important to just like advancing the capabilities of these systems. Does that answer your question, Chris? I, you seem to, it seemed like it was more like a time question about synchronization as well, right? Um, yeah, I guess uh, that, that also makes sense to me. I mean, it seems like, um, I, I guess what, what I want to, what, what I'm trying to think about is that there might be these different localized centers of trust, right? And maybe different parts of the network, in fact, like don't agree with each other, or uh, they don't want to, um, uh, you know, they might not agree on some central generative foundation model, right? Uh, so it seems like as opposed to presuming that we might want the ability to discover if they do in fact agree via some compositional process of coming to consensus. And in that process, I mean, part of my question is technical, like I don't know a lot about generative foundation models in particular. I don't know how to do source attribution, which seems like it's required 
for both what you're talking about and what I'm talking about, if I understand correctly. But also my question is like, how would the composition of these systems work uh, in a bottom-up way, or so to speak? Um, I agree, source attribution is very important for all of this stuff. Uh, it's a long conversation to go into the technical issues there, so I don't want to do that here. But um, uh, what I'd say is like, you know, the, whether people want to agree on an underlying model or not, the current technology for creating these things is such that um, they're ex like a huge part of their power comes from the diversity of the data. So the notion of groups just saying, look, I don't want to participate is going to leave them out of the opportunity to use these technologies. Um, and so like, I do think conceptualizing them on the one hand as being like the, you know, this very, very broad and quasi global public good. But on the other hand, understanding that precisely the extent that we'll be able to provide that depends on tracking all the different components that go into it, allowing them to localize and fine tune, but also using that tracking to ensure that you maximize that data diversity that leads to that global public good is probably going to be the most effective approach for most people. Now, of course, some will choose just not to use this technology at all and not opt out of it. I think they'll be at a disadvantage if they do that. Um, and probably they'll end up just using a model that they didn't in any way sort of get recognized or participate in creating. But, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, I can keep going, but I don't want to take too much time. Thank you. Um, okay, Awa, uh, would you like to go next? Thanks. Um, I have a question. It's kind of orthogonal from the last two questions. Uh, so if this is the right place to ask it, please let me know. Um, so our team is working on basically the technologies is like the coordination mechanisms that we think that could enable um, all these forms of more plural, more complex, more uh, also more interesting forms of governance, forms of funding public goods and so on. Um, one of the assumptions that we're making is that the primitive or the most constraining thing that currently these complex applications require is the fact that um, uh, the current infrastructure in Web2 and also in crypto is uh, computationally reductionist. As like we take value, right? The value from reality is actually very complex. It's just not, cannot, there's no way a scalar value um, represents it properly. But what we're doing right now with the financial systems and with crypto is we're taking the value of something in real life and we are compressing them into, for example, a dollar value, which is like 10 bucks, for example. So the assumption that we're making when designing the system was that that reductionality should be eliminated so we can make it much easier. So systems should not require you to reduce the dimensionality of value. So later on, it, you have also an easier time to build things that can represent more complex values. So this is like, my first question is, do you think this is like a, this assumption is correct? Like, could this be an interesting design direction? Uh, and if not, or, or if yes, uh, what other like primitives would you see? What other constraints you encounter with existing technologies when you're trying to build the systems like for money, um, quadratic cubic, like quadratic voting and so on. Uh, I'll jump in here quickly. So part of the presentation in the visual in the visuals was to actually show that whatever system of representation that we have, for example, in the governance, that the triangles, you know, those governance triangles are actually as complex and overlapping and interweaving as our social circles. And so I, I completely agree that the challenge is actually to like represent complexity and like not write it over. And to the extent that we write it over, we compromise our plurality. Um, but I, I will let Glenn jump in here and talk more about primitives on the, on the technical side. So uh, I definitely agree with the spirit of 
the direction you're going in. The one caution I would give, or or at least the one sort of um, complexity of the frame that I would highlight is that um, they're kind of like two different angles to commit this from. One angle is to say, look, we've got this insanely simplistic system right now where everything gets reduced to money. And we want to retain a little bit more of that because here are some like really critical areas where we see it going wrong and where we think we can do better. And I think that that is the direction that some of the like proposals in intersectional social data try to go in, some of the quadratic voting stuff, et cetera, uh, the plural money that you know Matt's been working on. The other perspective to come at it from is to be like, okay, the world is like just infinitely more complex than is represented by anything like this. We're gonna like take a pass at taking on the entire thing and just like not constraining it at all and like just get a model of the system and replace everything with that. And I think that that is often a mistake. Like it ends up basically turning in to whatever it is that your system that you don't understand is able to capture is everything, you know? And now you're gonna like try to overwrite every other institution that's been created anywhere. And you actually end up in a very totalizing agenda that way. So um, I absolutely believe in adding in complexity, but I believe in adding it in in a way that is like sort of a little bit step-by-step step and you know, legitimacy seeking and uh, understanding that any additional complexity you have will still miss most of what's out there. And so sort of doing it with a sort of humility and an exploratory perspective rather than like, oh, we're gonna capture everything now and, you know, uh, avoid all the simplifications. Great. Um, Sant, would you like to ask your question out loud or should I read it? Uh, yeah, sure, I can read it. Um, so my question is, can you speak about the potential goals and governance implications of continuous training, revocation-based retraining and data decay in creating localizations of GFMs that are adaptive to both the changing environments of specific communities and the ecosystems in which the fine-tuned models that they distribute are adopted by other and are adopted by other communities that build on those localized GFMs. I can also try to clarify if that question is not clear, but let me know if it's not clear. Yeah, I mean, I I think Sen, like what you're raising here is very rich, and I would almost ask you to just offer your own perspective on this. I mean, it's a conversation. It's not all going in one direction. Like, I mean, at least I haven't fully thought through or processed this and I'm probably unlikely to do it on the fly. So it sounds like you have something to bring to the conversation. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking, um, so if we imagine a kind of computational landscape where retraining or continuous training, uh, refined training of, uh, any type of model, whether it be multimodal, language-based, purely, or DFM and more broadly, um, then we might kind of start to consider the life cycles of the, the, the models. And so we can start to think about the, the, the possibility for continuous training. We can think about the possibility of um, uh, dealing with consent in a way that involves revocation. So if someone uh, maybe you're, you have one of these communities that are kind of have a kind of more complicated relationship with the the question of what data is included, or they want their data to be removed at some later point. And one of the issues is that the models kind of implicitly incorporate that data. Um, and so, unless you retrain the model, and this is my understanding, anyways, then that data kind of continues to have an afterlife, um, even though it's been removed from the data set. And so, possibly one way of kind of dealing with that or mitigating that might be to um, retrain the model based off of consent-based revocations or opting out. Um, and you might also want a model, a localized model that kind of updates and has a kind of element of recency or better reflects a snapshot of a community at any given point. And so this sort of suggests that there's a kind of more distributed and even 
landscape um, or um, asymmetry to uh, the different models that other communities might be building off of. So let's say one community builds um, a localized model and then they kind of make that available for other communities to use, but then they, at the, at the, at the core level, localized level, decide to um, retrain the model, um, but the other people who are using the model kind of are still using an older model. So you start to kind of get these information or I don't know exactly how you would describe it, but similar to kind of information asymmetry between the different localized models. And they both, they, they start to represent different kinds of clusterings of consensus or recency or consensus uh, or consent within organizations. So I guess I'm just thinking through that question and what those kind of implications have in terms of governance and um, a more kind of uh, pluralistic, uh, like really subsidiary based localization of DFMs. Uh, sent. Glenn, do you have uh, an immediate response? I, I was just going to say, sent. They're that... all good questions. They're all good yeah. questions. I mean, I don't, I don't have any. I mean, this is like a whiteboarding exercise at some level. It's, it's not really like something I have a hippie response to. Um, well, we have two minutes left. So, if anyone has any final questions, uh, you can ask, and then we'll uh, officially end. But uh, happy to stay for another 10 or 15 minutes if, if uh, folks want to continue the discussion. So okay. uh, I just want to yeah. I just want to thank everybody for coming. And um, as as Glenn said, this is an ongoing, obviously, <laughs> uh, to be continued uh, conversation. And uh, thank you for coming. And please feel free to reach out to me or anyone here in the radical exchange community to bounce these ideas off of and continuing to develop and refine them. Yeah, and hopefully we can uh, continue these conversations at this new uh, platform as well. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.